Good afternoon, Set Free Family. This is Pastor Caleb Howard coming at you with this week's edition of Thursday's Thought. I'm excited. I've got a word for you this afternoon. I know you're going to be blessed, you're going to be edified, and you're going to be challenged. I don't know about you, but I like to be challenged by the Word of God because I don't care how long you've been serving Him, we have not arrived. Amen? And there's always new places that we can go to in God, new dimensions that we can go to in his presence. And the only way we can access those is by obedience to what he is saying to us in this hour. So again, I want to thank you for tuning in. Share this video uh, on your platform so that your friends and family can tune in as well. And they will be blessed as well by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to remind you and encourage you to be with us this Sunday at 10 a.m. I'm telling you, I believe we're about to have an encounter with the presence of the living God. We're, we're seeing God move every weekend in our Sunday services. God is doing tremendous things in the earth this hour. I will be coming to you this Sunday and, and preaching the word of the Lord, and I've got a word from God to, uh, for this weekend. And so I want to encourage you to be here. Don't miss it because God is going to do great things in this place this weekend. Now let's get right into the thought for this week, and I'm going to be coming at you from Romans chapter 5 and verses 1 through 5. Romans chapter 5 and verses 1 through 5. Listen to this. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Verse 5, now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, there's a lot of wonderful truths in this, in this passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 5, speaking of faith, speaking of peace, speaking of hope, and speaking of love. All of these wonderful gifts that have been imparted to us by none other than the Holy Spirit. Now, you know as well as I, we are right at uh, of the threshold of Valentine's, uh, uh, this holiday where we supposedly celebrate love, we celebrate relationships and so forth. And so I thought it would be appropriate to bring this thought, this word, and that is that we need a revival of relentless love. Now, if you know me by now, you know I'm a student of revival. I love revival. Everything that's ever happened to me in a significant way in my walk with Christ always happen in an atmosphere and a spirit of revival and awakening. So I can't help it. It's, it's my DNA. It's in me. It's who I am. Amen. I'm a revivalist. And so I want to talk just for a moment about how we need a revival of relentless love in this hour. What is What does the term relentless mean? It means this, that you mean business that you mean business, not stopping until you get what you want, not taking no for an answer. You see, we as Pentecostals and Charismatics, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that, that this is a separate experience from the born again experience. Yes, when, when you're born again, you receive the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit that draws you under Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that brings conviction. It's the Holy Spirit that regenerates you. But there's a separate experience after that. And that is what we call the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And we teach along with this doctrine as well that the initial evidence of one receiving the baptism in the Holy Ghost is what? It is speaking in other tongues, speaking in other tongues. And that, that is very relevant. That is still for today. I don't care what others tell you. It will change your life. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I encourage you to seek after that because it will radically transform your life. Amen. But I want to talk to you about a, even a greater sign of one receiving the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And that sign 
is love. It is being dued with the very love of God, that agape love. That, that relentless love, if you will, that love that has no strings attached, amen, that love that will love the unlovable, that will even uh, equip you to love even your enemies. William J. Seymour, one of the founding fathers of Pentecostalism in this nation, you know the story of Azusa Street back in the uh, very beginning of the 1900s and how Pentecost swept from uh, California from the West Coast all the way to the East Coast. This, this powerful figure in history, William J. Seymour, he said this, and I quote, that the Pentecostal power, when you sum it all up, is just more of God's love. If it does not bring more love, it is simply a counterfeit. Wow. If it does not bring more love, this baptism in the Holy Ghost, then it is a counterfeit. It. You see, I've seen growing up in the Pentecost church, a lot of people that profess that I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, but yet they do not have love for one another. They do not have love for their pastors. They do not have love for their spouse. They do not have love uh, for, for their children. They do not have love for their co-workers or their fellow church uh, goers. They do not have love for their enemies. I question their Holy Ghost experience. Amen. Because the baptism of the Holy Ghost, when you sum it all up, it is a baptism in love. Francis Chan, another powerful figure in this present day, he said this, and I quote, that God's definition of what matters is straightforward. He measures our lives by how we love. Do you know that nothing you do in this life will ever matter unless it is about loving God and loving the people he has made? I believe he wants us to love others so much that we go to extremes to help them. Amen. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapters 12 and 13, it's an interesting story of the Apostle Paul bringing instruction, direction, and even correction to the Corinthian believers in that day and that hour. You know, they were a Pentecostal church, a spirit-filled church, a full gospel church. They believed in the infilling of the Holy Spirit. They believed in operating in the gifts of the Spirit. And I want to tell you that the gifts of the Spirit are still for today. Amen. They are still for today. As a matter of fact, if we ever needed to operate in the fullness of the power of the Holy Ghost and the gifts of the Spirit, we need to in this hour. Amen. But there was an issue in the church. Although they were operating in the gifts of the Spirit, they began to get caught up in themselves, boasting in their own gifts, boasting in their own selves, not giving the proper glory to God who was the bestower of the gifts. And they began to compete with one another. Well, I prophesy more than you. I speak in tongues more than you. I have the gifts of healing uh, operating in a greater fashion than you do. They began to get boast boasting in self and boasting in their own gifts. And so the apostle Paul comes to bring correction to them. He lets them know that it's wonderful. They're operating in the gifts, but there's a proper way to operate them. And I love this in 1 Corinthians 13. We, we commonly refer to this chapter as the love chapter. As he's bringing correction and rebuke even, he lets them know, and I'm just kind of summing it up in my own terms. He lets them know that all of these gifts, you can, you can have all of these gifts, but if you do not have love, then none of this means anything in the sight of God, in the ears of God. Matter of fact, he said, you can speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but if you do not have love, you're just a noise. You're just a nuisance in the ears of God. You can give your body to be burned as a martyr, but if you do not have love, it means nothing. You can feed the hungry and clothe the naked, but if you do not have love, it means nothing in the sight of God. In other words, he was, he was letting them know that the only thing that really validates the fullness and the power of the Holy Ghost is that you are walking in the love of God toward one another. If there's ever been a time and an hour in the church where we needed to demonstrate that love of God, that relentless love that will love the unlovable, that will not give up on others, that will think the best about others, we need it in this hour. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 says this, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, not a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You see, the spirit of love is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of love because God 
is love. It's not just an attribute of, of, of God, but he is love. It is, it is his very essence. Amen. You see, we oftentimes do not love what we fear and do not understand. Did you hear what I said? Oftentimes we have a hard time loving what we, what we fear and what we do not understand. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35 says this, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Over and over throughout the New Testament, we are commissioned to love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How are people going to know that we're a disciple of Christ? Is that we have love one one for another, that we love one another with the love of God. I'm talking about loving God, loving others, even loving your enemies, and yes, even loving yourself. Because the truth is, if you don't love yourself, you can't love others. Amen? You see, the cross, the cross of Christ, it, it ran both vertical and it ran horizontally signifying that our love for God is number one, but also that we must love one another. Amen. Matthew 22, 34 through 40, it commissions us again to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But notice it didn't define who our neighbor is. It left it in a broad spectrum, if you will, signifying that this love, the love of God that causes us to love our neighbor, it transcends all barriers, both racial, gender, generational, denominational, political. Uh, love your neighbor. It means whoever God puts before you, you are to show them. You are to demonstrate to them the very love of God. My brother, my sister, my friend, this is what we need in this hour. We need an infusion of the love of God. We need a revival of relentless love. We need a baptism in the love of our Father God. Amen. That will cause us to love one another. That will cause us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. There's a world that's looking for love today, but they're looking in all the wrong places. But we have the answer. We have the antidote. We have the key, and that is God. I want to encourage you today to get back to your first love to be baptized in the love of God, to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And people are going to see a difference and we're going to win this world by love. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in this afternoon. I pray you've been blessed and encouraged by this small thought from the word of God. And I pray you have a great day in the Lord and we cannot wait to see you this Sunday. God bless you.